Hello, everybody. This is Jake Senziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Props Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, it's snowing in Knoxville. You're there. We're ready to go. How you doing, bro? What are you up to? MIH, we got the salt out today. We got a slight delay, but the folks are going to you know, get in there, kick down doors, and we're going to make it happen. What's going on on your end? Not much. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank everyone out there who's spending their time with Jake and Gina on the podcast right now. We've got a great guest today. Our goal on the podcast, as always, is to make it entertaining, enjoyable, actionable content. Um, we've got a great topic today. Uh, all about networking, Jake. It's all about creating relationships, and I'm pumped to go. What's up with you? Hey, well, let's get into it then. Today's guest is multifamily broker extraordinaire, Tyler Chesser. Tyler is going to give us a sneak peek at the inside game of selling multifamily real estate and his outlook on 2019. So without further ado, Tyler, welcome to the show. Good morning, gentlemen. It's an honor to be here with you guys. Actually, you guys are blowing up the space, so uh, definitely happy to spend some time with you today. Thank you. Hey, happy to have you on. Tell us why you got into multifamily real estate. I think it's all about the why. So t tell us your why and why you got into this game. You know, it's funny. I think a lot of us kind of things happen by happenstance at times. And I uh, started my career in the corporate world and I was doing international marketing for a Fortune 500 firm. Uh, and it was actually, you know, it was actually really exciting in a lot of ways, but it really didn't give me the freedom and the control over my life that I wanted. And so I started to explore what are other options for me? What are other things that you know, maybe overlap my skill set and some other, you know, items that, you know, I'm really interested in, in terms of finances, in terms of dollars, in terms of numbers, uh, in terms of control over my own effort, in terms of what the results may be as a result of that effort. And so long story short, I, I ended up getting into the multi -real, uh, multifamily real estate uh, brokers business. And so I actually got referred early in that uh, process to a uh, group that owned a portfolio of about $30 million worth of multifamily assets, as well as uh, some office mixed use, as well as retail. And so through that process, I kind of jumped in, uh, you know, face first, really, for lack of a better description, uh, of learning that game and learning really what investors are looking for in terms of cash flow, cash on cash, internal rate of return. And so it was really kind of a, an immense learning process in the beginning that then caused me to say, you know what, this is really... You know, if you, if you look at what Robert Kiyosaki says, it's like, look, this is, this is how the rich live. I mean, this is, you know, you're acquiring assets that then produce additional cash flow and additional, you know, benefits such as depreciation, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And so for me, it's a, it was a very attractive uh, world to be in, as well as all of the different, um, you know, pieces in terms of how I'm able to collaborate with my clients in different ways, partner and I actually acquire assets myself. And so that's, that's long and short of it. That's how I got in the business. So why multifamily? Why not strip malls? Why not office? Why not industrial? Why not self-storage? Why multifamily? Well, multifamily, in my opinion, um, is the best asset class in terms of the risk and the control and, you know, what you can do in terms of providing upside to that asset. Um, if I look at, you know, I actually study all commercial real estate assets very closely. Uh, because I'm always looking for those opportunities. I'm always looking to advise my clients effectively. Um, and, you know, if I look at like retail right now, there are significant challenges in that side of the business. I mean, obviously, everyone knows it. Amazon is crushing many of the big box businesses in particular. And then also many of the, you know, smaller businesses that are acquiring, you know, that are occupying such as, you know, 10 to 15,000 square feet. So obviously, you've got a much riskier asset because of the occupants. I mean, we're looking at what does the occupant look at in terms of their, you know, their options here. And so, um, so thinking back to multifamily, of course, if you look at, you know, what's going on in terms of the trends, more people are choosing to rent, whether it's necessity or by choice. I mean, you know, many people who are earning, you know, great incomes are saying, you know what, I'd rather be a renter because it gives me more options, gives me more flexibility. I can get more amenities. So it's kind of a win-win situation. So if I look at it from all those perspectives, I think it's a less risky asset that then has more upside in many ways. Also, I mean, if you think about office, for example, I mean, many people are doing a lot of co-working space or they're working from home or they're working in Starbucks or what have you. So you've got a lot of changing dynamics in business. And so if I look at all of the different asset classes, I really just feel like multifamily in terms of the trajectory, because this is such a long-term business, is where you want to be. And so for me, I'm, I'm looking at where's the puck now and also where's the puck going 
and I want to be skating way past where that puck is going. And so that's kind of the decision as far as my involvement in this asset class. The, the other issue is if you own a house like the G dad, right? You're, you're on the beach there in Florida and you gotta, you gotta do all these, these, uh, you know, classy renovations. It becomes a money pit, right? Uh, right there, Mr. Barbaro. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Stenzianuski back there talking about money pits. Huh? Let's share a little war stories here. You start taking on those cabinets, start painting them. And all of a sudden the wife goes, how about them floors? I think that those doors look nice too, huh? The windows and all of a sudden it's like the big money pit. So, bling, 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 bling. so we, renting, renting can be attractive from that standpoint as well. The, so. um, I think uh, Jake's talked on a nerve for me because, you know, you talk about rich dad, poor dad, right? And everyone used to think the house was an asset and it was when it was going up, right? It's putting money in your pocket because you're levering up and you're using yeah. your house as an ATM. Cool thing, right? The problem is that gravy train stopped right now and assets aren't going up as much as they were and we're at the top end of it. So that's risky. And I think people see that. I think the other thing, Tyler, you touched on when, when employees, half of the employee workforce is going to be 1099 in the next couple of years. So why buy a house? Why be tied down to a certain location? Um, and I know millennials right now, the internet can make you work anywhere. If you're working on Fiverr or Upwork, you are just working anywhere you want to. So why would you want to buy a house, be tied down, and be tied down to market um, you know, fluctuations? So I, I totally agree with everything you've said. Now, do you remember your first deal, first deal you transacted? What did you learn from it, uh, the pain points? And um, you know, just share that story with us. Yeah. Um I mean, I'm not sure if I, well, the first deal, um, it was probably like a fourplex or something like that. And really, you know, I'm like, man, I just hope that I learn. I hope I don't screw this up. You know, I'm getting nervous the whole time. I'm like, well, what do I do next? Who, you know, wait, who's the next step of the process? So, you know, it was certainly a learning process that I had to be truthful and, and humble about and say, you know what, I don't really know what's next here. And, and it's actually kind of basic looking back some of the things that I wasn't aware of, but you know, there were certainly issues from, you know, from the negotiation standpoint to, you know what, I didn't really fully know how to value these assets. You know, I'm thinking, look, this asset value is based on a price per square foot, where I guess you could possibly say that in a one to four unit ratio could possibly be, be still valued in that way in terms of what the market looks at it. However, you know, I wasn't really fully aware of, you know, cap rates or the association of value there or you know, cash on cash and the utilization of leverage and all these different things, as well as condition of the property and, and uh, team members that would be required for th that investor to be successful. And so, um, you know, actually it went, it ended up going smooth, um, but it was still such a learning process, at least internally. It was like, man, for me, it didn't go smooth. It worked out for everybody else, but as the broker in that standpoint, it was like, man, I had a lot to learn. So what did you learn? What other differences are there between residential and commercial? Because four unit is still, I guess, considered residential. When you started scaling up, what were the differences? I mean, other than the um, emotions, basically people like to look at the paint colors and they like the floors and the view of residential. What are the big things stuck out with you, the difference between residential and multi? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of differences. Um, I will say across the board, one thing that I really try to do as a broker myself is ensure that I'm always adding value. I'm not that guy who's just, hey, you know what, I'm here to push a piece of paper for you and I'll see you at the closing. Like, I wanna be able to advise and then also add enough value to where they're either, either making or saving thousands of dollars on either the acquisition or the disposition. So, you know, for me, I think that's actually a difference in a lot of either commercial brokers as well as residential brokers. Is that There are many who are kind of just there. Um, and that are, you know, lucky to be in the game or, you know, they've got some sort of a connection there that really doesn't make sense other than adding value. And since I didn't have any family in the business or anything like that before, I, I, I inherently had to do that. But as far as what you see in the differences between commercial real estate brokers as well as residential real estate, I mean, certainly there are a lot of differences. Um, when I think of like, really, if you if you're looking at purchasing a house, a lot of times it's more emotion based than any factual based content as far as the decision making. And so, you know, obviously we all make decisions based on emotions at some point. And I think it's important to recognize that in any negotiation, but it's more so front and center on a residential purchase or, or sale than it is on a commercial sale. Because on a commercial sale, whether it's a multifamily large property, say it's, you know, say it's five plus units, obviously you want to be, you know, larger, I believe in scale in this, in this side of the business. Um, but you know, really you're looking at what's the risk, what's the risk profile of this asset and then what's the upside and what kind of, you know, what's the strategy going into this? I mean, this is more of an acquisition of a business than it is an acquisition of a piece of property. 
And certainly the piece of property is the foundation of that business. But I think those are the differences in terms of the thought process in acquiring a residential asset versus a commercial real estate asset. I like that. When you're looking at a, at a, at a buyer or a seller, what, what are you looking for when a buyer approaches you? What is his profile to take him seriously? In this market right now, number one is realistic because, you know, I get people call me, I mean, literally all day, every day. Hey, I'm looking for from every corner of the United States as well as internationally. And everybody says, Hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm looking to invest in it. A lot of this is most of this is multifamily because it's the hot word of the day. We all know this. It's the sexy asset because of a lot of different things. A lot of people can understand it, but I think realistic is by far the most important piece of this because we have to pay attention to what the market forces are providing. Of course, you want to be as aggressive as possible, but don't call me saying I want an A class asset in the in a sub in a, you know an A class sub market you know at a ten cap and a twenty percent cash on cash and a twenty five percent IRR. Like I just you know for me that's not realistic. Um, you know you maybe you know, highly tertiary. <laughs> What's that? You can't do that. I mean, it's we it's brought not, you on the show, man. I thought you were going to pull something out of your ass here. Come on, man. It's, out, it's certainly an outlier. I've I'll take that, that deal. It's like, if it happens, that's great. Let's all go celebrate. But don't call me. With that. It's so exhausting. So uh, I know that that's that's a little bit aggressive, but yeah, that's that's one of the worst things that I see all the time. So what else are you looking for? I mean, like Jake and I, we have a credibility book. When we, when we, I mean, because a lot of our students don't have any assets, but they create this credibility book that has a business plan that has, and then some of them don't have assets at all, and they look like they're professional. Yeah. What else are you looking for? I mean, honestly, somebody that calls you up, completes, creates the rapport with you. What else? I mean, because a lot of people call you once, and they'll probably never call you back. Mm -hmm. Is it something that you want these buyers to keep calling you back so that it takes them serious? What else are you looking for in them? I think I'm also looking for, I mean, it, it's such a relationship business and it's like, you know, what kind of value are you bringing to the table? Because, you know, at the end of the day, there's so much demand out there and it's just, you know, it's just who's going to, who's going to spend their, your time wisely and who's not, I mean, who's going to perform. So I think some things that I look for in that when I hear from a new buyer would be, you know, what type of team do you have in place? You know, what type of financing do you have in place? If you have not acquired other assets, you know, tell me about the track record that you have in terms of raising capital or what type of equity you have access to. And, you know, let's let's talk in detail about that, because otherwise, you know, we've got to move extremely quickly when opportunities do come about, whether they're a 10, 10 cap asset in a, you know, an a market or, you know, whether they're realistic, you know, six and a half or seven or whatever. And so um, I think I look for performance. And those are the questions that I'm asking is what what type of access to equity do you have? And what type of team do you have in place so we can be efficient, uh, especially on the due diligence process? Because, you know, we've got to move very quickly to be competitive in this market. We need to get due diligence done within 30 days. And really, we need to be on the early end of that spectrum. So I want to know what's the team look like, how serious are you, and, and how equipped are you to move quickly? So I, I want to just chime in here for because it sounds like if we, want to, if we want to package this up, you're looking for a closer. You're looking for somebody that can Absolutely. get it done at the end of the day. 100%. That's, that's exactly distill it down. That's what we need. I mean, because right now it's like, look, yeah, we want to, we want to do the right thing for everyone. If the deal doesn't work out, it's no big deal. We have to, we have to do what we have to do. But if you can't close, then at the end of the day, there's no, there's no reason to really spend time on this. And time is your greatest resource. 1000. Absolutely. So Tyler, on our deals, a lot of our deals, uh, we teach the buy right framework, buy right, manage right, uh, finance right. That's the proprietary framework that we use. A lot of these deals in the buy right are coming back. And a lot of our students are like, we're underwriting them, actual numbers. Can I put a low ball offer in? What do you say to people who have an actual five and a half, six cap? They're coming with the actual numbers and it's still way below, you know, an asking price. How, how would you, you know, go about that? How would you present that to the seller? I mean, if we have facts that support, you know, an acquisition price that is proposed, then I'm more than happy to present that. However, if I have a client who comes to me and says, look, I see this asset, I want to make an offer for it, you know, at a nine cap or whatever it is. And I'm just throwing out numbers, obviously. But what I try to do to them is like, hey, look, I'm going to I'm more than happy to do what you need me to do. However, I'm going to tell you what's probably likely to happen. You're probably going to get a seller that says, thank you. No, thank you. Don't ever talk to us again a lot of times. And so is that in your best interest? I mean, certainly everyone has to make their own decisions that's right for their business. But 
you know, if you're going to make an offer that has no factual basis behind it, it's not really something that's going to really have any standing in terms of making the deal happen. However, I mean, I have seen many deals over the past couple years in particular in a very hot market where we said, look, you're asking a certain dollar amount, which is significantly higher than what we're willing to do. And here's why. If we're able to make an actual argument based on facts, I'm more than happy to present something that's way above or below wherever, you know, the seller is. Um, because a lot of people have very high expectations as well. I think that's also something we're looking at in this market is that sellers have a little bit maybe higher expectations than possibly, possibly reality, whereas they certainly have the leverage. But um, so it, it's an education process all around. I like that because a lot of students come to us and say, you know what, these deals don't make any sense. I just say, do your underwriting, send it over to Tyler, let Tyler take a look at it. If it's an actual five and a half gap, you're buying an actual numbers, you need to get financing. You're not gonna get financing if the numbers don't work. So at least build a rapport with the broker, um, be upfront with him, and don't be afraid. Um, what qualities should, we have talking what you're looking for, what qualities should I be looking in a broker like yourself to be successful? Because there's a lot of brokers out there who quote unquote are multifamily brokers, but as I found out, there's only top four or five in every market. It's yeah. to the Pareto's principle where it's the 80-20. Number one, where do I find a Tyler in the market? Number two, what am I looking for in a Tyler to be successful? I think you're looking for, first of all, somebody who has integrity, somebody who's going to do the right thing. Um, but really, the separators in terms of my opinion is certainly what's your track record? I mean, what type of transactions have you actually closed You know, over the past several years? I want to see experience. I want to see somebody who's adding value. Um, for me, a big separator for my own business has been the CCIM designation. Um, so going through that process and fully understanding you know, really the, the metrics that allow success in this business. So I'd like to see, you know, brokers with designations. I'd like to see, you know, honestly, one of the big things in our business is, is awards and recognition. I'd like to see somebody who's been recognized in various different ways um, because that shows a, a true track record of success. I'd like to see referrals. I want to see, you know, I want to see a website filled with testimonials um, and, you know, just somebody who you can get along with because really you do end up spending a lot of time with this person. Um, whether it's for one acquisition or many, you know, hopefully I think it's a long-term business. And so you'd be looking at, at many. Um, one thing that is lacking in our business, I think is um, a lot of loyalty. And so if you've got somebody who's willing to add value to you on a, you know, really it's a contingent basis. I mean, brokers do not get paid until a deal is closed. And so if you've got somebody who's willing to offer you value um, without the guarantee of getting paid, and they've got additional track record as well as recognition and such. I think that's really what you'd be looking for. And I, I totally agree that the Pareto principle is 100% at play in terms of each market. I mean, you really, depending on the size of the market, I, I think you hit it on the head. I mean, in our market, there's probably four or five different brokers in this space that are doing by far the majority of the business. So it's very important. So how do I find you in the market, those four or five? Where's the best place to find them? Well, um, you know, I think uh, actually, you know, I was talking about CCIM. We actually have a website called findaccim.com. Um, so I would actually recommend, uh, you know, individuals who are looking to acquire assets in various different markets. Every single major city in the country has a certified commercial investment member uh, designees. And so I would start there. And once you're able to kind of do some research, obviously, you know, many, many others talk about, you know, searching on, on LoopNet or Crexy. Believe it or not, actually, I think a lot of brokers are kind of at odds with, uh, with LoopNet in, in particular. Uh, they've been kind of price gouging in, in various different ways. It hasn't been nearly as effective. So, you know, I think certainly it could be an effective piece in terms of your own research from finding a broker. But, you know, a lot of brokers are saying, you know what, I'm good without uh, LoopNet. And so there's different um, avenues. And I think we're, we're going through a different changing type of period in the business as well, whereas a lot of assets are not openly marketed on LoopNet or you know, regional uh, catalyst type sites or, or such. So you want to do your, your online research, but you also want to be boots on the ground in that market and start talking to people. I mean, because that's, at the end of the day, brokers, how they offer the most value is through their market knowledge and through what they know and what type of conversations they've been having on a daily basis. So you want to have that background and understanding of overall, but then I want you to get out in the market and, and, and walk around the streets and try to figure out what's going on. So Tyler, part of that value, are you the guy that I should go to to ask for referrals as far as property management companies, as far as brokers and bankers? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think in my business, yes. Not Now, not every broker is going to act that way. I mean, I, I see what I do as I want to add value kind of as a quarterback for my clients, you know, because, look, I'm seeking long-term relationships. I don't care about one deal. I don't care about two deals. In my opinion, no deal is better than a bad deal because if someone doesn't succeed, then, you know, they're not going to come back and do business with me. I mean, they, I'm somebody who's adding value. And so if I look at, you know, team members, Obviously, as I mentioned before, that is key to being successful in this business. It's obviously a team sport. So I'm more than happy to kind of direct my clients in various different ways, whether it's property management, which is obviously, you know, paramount in terms of importance, uh, as well as, um, you know, financing, whatever you need, more than happy to kind of be that, you know, I'm not going to make the decisions for my clients, but I'm more than happy to put them in the conversations they need to succeed. So I'm going to ask a touchy question for brokers. Um, yep. I see the crystal ball in the future. I see your commissions getting cut. What are the average broker doing to parlay that other than adding value? Do you see that happening? Because everyone's so price conscious now. And I think when the market takes a dip and assets are easy to be had, how can we fight against that? Because everything's becoming disruptive, whether it's commercial financing. And I mean, it's happened in the residential space as far as Zillow. Do you see it happening in commercial uh, going forward? Well, I think it goes back to it's it's key to make sure that you're adding a tremendous amount of value. I mean, there's there's been deals where I, I can really track back and say, look, I made my client over half a million dollars. And so for me, it's like, you know, for that, you know, if you look at it that way, it's like, hello, this is a tremendous amount of value. So you've really got to be an expert in the space. You've got to be a continuous learner. You've got to be somebody who's skating ahead of where the puck is going to be. And And that's what I try to do as a broker myself. But certainly recognize the fact that, you know, you have a lot of technological solutions that can replace a lot of the services that brokers do. But I think at the end of the day, since it is such a relationship business, I don't really see that changing in the long term. I think perhaps, you know, there will be adjustments. There definitely will be adjustments and adaptations. But I think in terms of looking at the deal and saying, all right, well, here's, here's the facts. And then here's some intangibles that perhaps you were not aware of. And, and being that kind of identifying where those blind spots are, to me is, is something that, you know, I think people would certainly be missing out on. A lot of people say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be, and I don't think they say this, but they, they inadvertently do this is I'm going to be dollar, you know, you know, penny wise and dollar foolish. And so a lot of people say, you know what, I'm just going to sell my property off market, whatever, without a broker. And I think that without that mark in tune market knowledge of really your top producers, then I think they could be missing out on a lot of money. And so, it's kind of that additional investment that really allows that to be, you know, captured. Mm -hmm. I like that. What networking tips do you have? Cause it is relationship based. I have to like you, you have to like me, we have to get along. I have to send you a couple of gifts and I have to really build a rapport and it's long-term any networking tips. Maybe you want to meet ups or, you know, how, how I, how I meet guys like you. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's still, it, it's such a long-term business. It's like, you know, I don't want someone to come up to me and, and just meet me one day and then expect me to give them my very best deal the very next day. So, you know, it's what can, what can there be a symbiotic relationship, you know, where you're offering value to me, I'm offering value back to you. That's how I see is really the foundation of all relationships. And so I see it as no different in this space in terms of where can you meet these people? Um, you know, there's a lot of organizations that, you know, you may, be inclined to join or be a part of, you know, certainly real estate associations uh, in various different markets. I have, at least in our market, I've noticed that, you know, the Kentucky Real Estate Investors Association at times can be more of a residential focus. So if you're, if you're in that space, you know, it makes sense to be a part of that group there. Um, we also have exchanger groups. We also have, you know, like I said, CCIM is also open as a networking organization as well. So I would highly recommend uh, spending time at those uh, type of organizations. Uh, Urban Land Institute is another. Uh, there are many others, but, you know, I think it's becoming knowledgeable and building those relationships. Just really, it's, and, and it doesn't have to be all based on business. It's like, you know what, what can we do to, to overlap interests outside of just business? You know, because it's, it's such a long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. I like that. What's going on in the market right now? What were cap rates in your market, you know, typical returns in the market IRR? What, what are you seeing in your market? Well, I think it's interesting because, you know, last year at the end of the year, obviously people are getting a lot worried about the rising interest rates. And, uh, you know, a lot of that continual rise was starting to cause a little bit of uh, cap rate compression in different ways or, you know, regression. And so widening and, and enlarging those cap rates. 
And so now since, uh, you know, December, there has been kind of a pullback from the Fed on that. And so what we're seeing is, in, you know, continued uh, heightened demand for multifamily assets. And, you know, any deal has a huge amount of interest and multiple offers, you know, many, many times multiple offers. You and got to so, lock long term right now. Now is the time. This is the last chance. Lock it up now before it jumps, right? Absolutely. That, that, Absolutely. That's your pitch, Tyler. That's what you need. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's true. It has to be because, you know, if you, we have a lot of interesting forces macroeconomically at play right now that I think are affecting every single market, whether it's the United States or, or elsewhere. And certainly, certainly here in the United States in terms of political, in terms of economic and, and all the different forces that we just talked about, every business is going, undergoing a major disruption right now and a change. And so there's really a lot of uncertainty, whereas, you know, but I think a lot of people see multifamily as more of a certain asset and more of a certain play moving forward. And so I think that's why you still have such a huge amount of demand for those assets. So in terms of cap rates and such, what I'm seeing in this market, I mean, we, we are still hovering around five and a half, five cap for, you know, your top tier class A deals, you know, all the way down to, you know, you're, I'll, I'll just, I'll just go down the list here for your B class deals. You're, you're right around six cap, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And if you've got a C class deal, it's a value add. I mean, there are a lot of times where those deals are still trading at six and a half cap, sometimes six and a quarter. I mean, we, we do have some dumb money out there and uh, you know, it's really interesting because there's been some assets that have traded that have really befuddled me in a lot of ways. And I'm thinking, oh, after some time has passed, we're starting to see some of those assets come back. And really, you know, the, the narrative from some of these folks is, well, you know, we've, we've, our strategy is kind of adjusting and we're making some changes and such. And really what we know it is, is they're negative. I mean, you cannot acquire an asset at a certain price and make it work. I mean, it's like, it's just the fundamentals. And so um, it'll be interesting to see how that continues to play out, but that's what I'm seeing in the market right now. So that's one factor that that's going to put a chink in the armor. I think the other one is the jobs. If the economy slows down, multifamily is all about jobs and job yeah. growth. And fortunately, you're lucky you're, you're living in a market where people are migrating and job growth is still pretty good. What other things do you see that can affect multifamily valuations? Yeah, I think jobs for sure is 100%. Um, important. I mean, because if your tenants can't, if they can't afford it, then they're not going to live there. But I do think that it's more impactful on those top tier class A luxury deals, especially the new construction. So I think if you're insulated in that way, whether it's your own sub market, if you're in a secondary or tertiary market, or, you know, if you're kind of a, you know, more of a lower price alternative, I think that's extremely important. Um, in terms of other things that are impacting the market, I mean, like I said, in terms of just the adjustment of all business, I mean, because people are earning money in different ways. It's not the same way that, you know, our parents and grandparents uh, grew up where it's like, you know, go to school, get a good job and work there until you're 65 and get a pension and so on and so forth. That narrative does not exist anymore. I mean, it, it may in a very outlier scenario, but it really, I, I don't see that existing. And so I think a lot of people are kind of adjusting in that and they're still going through that process. It'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. I thought it was interesting what you mentioned as far as uh, the 1099 scenario, I, I hadn't heard that before, but um, I think that's, that's a big piece is there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what, you know, what providing for your family looks like uh, as we continue in the 21st century. Well, think about it. I mean, 1099s are great. You don't have to pay for their health care. You know, they're, they're not a full-time employee. You don't really control their employment. So a lot of people like that because you know what, I can work at a couple different places. I can pick up and leave and I'm contracted out. So employers love that. And as healthcare keeps going up, that that's what that's what the name of the game is. They're trying to push off those costs to uh, to the employees, you know. Well, the other piece of it is healthcare. I mean, you've got a major shift going on there. I mean, that's it's still a big problem. I mean, I know that my cost of healthcare is I feel astronomical, but not even in comparison to others that I've seen. And so there's there's a huge issue there. You also have if you look at demographics. I mean, we've got a major shift in terms of baby boomers that are exiting the workforce, and there's a huge gap of you know, needed jobs to be filled that are not being filled right now. So I think those are some really interesting factors that would be interesting to see how that plays out. So it's funny you say that, Tyler, because 20 years ago, I started a business. Healthcare wasn't even on the radar for me. It was 300 bucks a month for a family. 
And the other component that we haven't even touched on yet is even student debt. So you put student yeah. debt, you put healthcare, those two factors will tie people and make people a slave to their job. Because I, I coach people every day, and those are the two things that they say, if I lose my job, people even in the military who want to retire a little earlier, who are teachers want to retire, they can't retire early because of they, they won't be able to get healthcare for the rest of their lives. So it's really holding people back on those two components. So I think that's really important when you're looking at, at, at a macroeconomic level. Absolutely. And, and let me just say to just on the student debt piece, I mean, I heard recently that student debt is the number one uh, liability on the balance sheet of the federal government. So not only is it a huge problem for a lot of people in terms of, you know, the slave type of uh, situation in terms of their employment, but we've got a major problem here in terms of what's going to happen when some of these uh, loans are defaulted on. Uh, in Everybody terms just stops paying. There's your next bubble, baby. Exactly. Exactly. So what's going to happen then? I mean, it's very interesting. But so what, hap what happens if, if the, what happens if the government though does debt relief and they say, you know what, we're going to forgive a lot of these loans. That's it's like well, written into it. Like that is like the one thing that they will never forgive. I have to remember, you have a lot of people who are running on that platform. So just be careful. <laughs> that, that's good. That, I mean, listen, the government just did a $900 billion, uh, you know, um, they, they have $900 billion in, in, in uh, debt this year that they're adding on. That's going to affect interest rates. Interest rates are going to have to go up sooner or later. So it's, that's, I think, another component that's going to affect multifamily. As, as rates go up, stuff's going to get more expensive. So I think all those pieces together um, you know, are going to really affect everything. Before we get to the short answer questions, what's your best piece of advice or tip to um, an investor who wants to create a relationship with a broker? The number one piece of advice that anyone wants to create a relationship with a broker? Yeah. I mean, I think you have to have a long-term view. Don't be this guy who's in a massive hurry that, you know, hey, I just met you and now I want, you know, this deal and can you help me? And, you know, I, if I were to give anybody any one piece of advice, I would say have a long-term view of how can you add value and how can you create a true relationship with this person that they can trust you and they can count on you to perform and all these different things. You know, so where it's a really, it's a deep relationship rather than just a basic surface level that maybe we'll never see each other again. Mm -hmm. Gino, you know what I miss? What? You don't remember? He brought up the regional catalyst website. Man, when we got started, I was picking off these like little 20 and 30 unit deals off of this. And it was like, I was going on and shopping. I miss those days, man. I like that. You know, we're picking up these little, these little, little baby deals and just, you know, adding them into the portfolio. They don't exist anymore. They're not there. They went bye-bye. It does not exist. Unfortunately. Guys, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. All right, so I want to get into a little personal development, Tyler. I see some books back there. What is your best habit for success? We hear about the miracle morning from people all the time. What is something that you do on a daily or weekly basis that's led to your success? Absolutely. I mean, uh, my mornings are sacred to me, and uh, every single morning I'll just go through my morning routine. I get up at 5 a.m. Uh, when I wake, you know, first thing I do is chug a glass of water, um, put the cup of co uh, pot of coffee on the, on the steamer there, get it going and, uh, you know, go through my gratitude exercises. I think about three things I'm grateful for. Uh, and then I get right into reading. Uh, I read about an hour every day. I read a book a week. It's one thing that's really set, set me apart in terms of my mind ability as well as my knowledge and just ideas. Um, so that's been certainly something to really set me apart. Uh, I also meditate, which obviously is, is a big, you know, kind of a, a buzzword in these days, but just being aware of the thought process and, and you, know, you know, how our minds are you know, working for us and against us is extremely important. Uh, also, uh, obviously, I eat breakfast every morning as well. Um, I actually cook breakfast every morning, bacon and eggs. I mean, I've got to have, I got to have my, my meat and protein. Uh, after that, I work out. 
uh, for about an hour every day. And so for me, it's like if I can have a strong body, a strong mind and time for myself in the morning, I'm ready to I'm ready to kick the day's ass. I mean, that's that's Woo! if I don't do that, then I can't I can't be myself, you know, so that's that's uh, I would say those are my keys to success. So I, I see a red book back there with some yellow writing on it. What, what's that one? You want to pull that one off? Oh, I see a blue one too. I just want to know what those are about. I know, I know that uh, I know that those are near and dear to your heart. So I had to put those there. So yeah. What do we What do we got cranking back there? What are those for the for the folks that are not on YouTube? Yeah. So I mean, we've got a lot of stuff here. Um, actually, these are my on deck. So um, actually, one of my biggest problems is I buy like ten books at a time. That's not a problem, man. Just just yeah, make sure you get through them. Yeah, so we've got we've got the Black Swan, which I believe uh, you guys are uh, quite fond of as well. Uh, uh, Smarter, Better, Faster by Charles Duhigg is actually um, I don't know if you've read the book uh, Power of Habit by Charles yep. Duhigg. Yep. Mm -hmm. That is a phenomenal book, and uh, this author is amazing. Uh, we've got Maps of Meaning by uh, Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson uh, also wrote a book called Twelve Rules for Life, which I highly recommend uh, for anybody, whether they're in this business or not. Um, you got Zeckendorf, who's one of the most legendary uh, real estate developers out of New York City back in the day. We've got Rod Cleef, How to Create Lifetime Cash Flow Through Multifamily Properties, which we all love Rod. I was actually at his uh, conference a couple months ago. Uh, we've got Poor Charlie's Almanac by, um, you know, Charlie Munger, one of the most legendary investors of all time. I actually just read um, Ben Franklin's um, biography and, you yeah, know, him yeah, yeah. the, the poor, uh, poor Richard's Almanac and all this yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, amazing, phenomenal guys and uh, really exciting. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I love books, man. This is, we could go on and on for, uh, for a very long time on books. But uh, on, that, on that shelf with the horse on it, you got, a, you got a blue one there and a red one. What are those ones? Yes, sir. We got the Fountainhead. We got Atlas Shrugged oh. by Avery. Oh man. Brand oh, partner, man. shout out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. I like that. So, so um going into 2019, Tyler's uh, crystal ball, does the buyer demand still exist? What's what's the what's Tyler's 2019 outlook for multifamily? Yeah, the buyer demand certainly still exists, especially with that pullback in interest rates. I mean, people money is still extremely cheap and, you know, like I said, I think we're seeing a lot of uncertainty in a lot of places, but we're seeing certainty in multifamily. So I think that demand remains. It's just a matter of, you know, what do you need to adapt and what do you need to be competitive in this market? So I certainly see that continuing. Now, how long that lasts based on all these different factors, I don't know. Um, I wish I could tell you, but I think that, you know, when it doesn't last at some point, when it, when it does change, I think you've got you've to look at it as, you know what, Maybe I'm fearful, but these are opportunities. And so that's, that's kind of how I look at it. What project are you excited about right now? Well, I've got a few different projects I'm excited about, one of which I cannot share yet. It's not a, uh, it's not a public, uh, public thing, but I'm oh. very excited. Maybe we'll have a follow-up to discuss about that here soon. Uh, also, you know, like I said, I'm extremely um, you know, passionate about personal development. And so actually working with a partner on kind of launching a, a kind of a you know, a coaching type of a platform uh, for that because I mean, for me, personal development is the key to being successful. Whether Gino, it's you a joint venture coming on here, you know, uh, we, get, we get Jake and Gina with with the, with the broker team here. I, I feel it, man. There's something there. Let's go. I'm in. I'm in. I'm ready. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm excited. I, I'm just excited about every day. I mean, every day is a new opportunity, you know. And actually, one thing I heard recently was you know, recreate yourself daily. And because it's like, you know what? Yes, what you did yesterday obviously compounds to today and tomorrow, but you've got to get after it every day. And so I'm excited for that. Very cool. Very cool. What's the best way for listeners to get a hold of you? My website is tylerchester.com. Uh, I can also be accessed on Instagram and Twitter at the Tyler Chester. Um, also on Facebook as well, of course. Uh, but Instagram, uh, Twitter, and my website. You can also subscribe on my website as well if you want to stay in touch with me. Um, but yeah, I'd love to love to connect with your listeners. So guys, here's the thing. At the end of the day, Tyler's a nice guy, but don't waste his time, right? So when you when you're calling up, he has a lot of guys, you know, hitting him every day. So the key to this is you got to be a closer. You got to be prepared. You got to do your homework. The mindset shift for people getting into this space is that yes. Tyler's in sales, but so are you. You need to know how to sell yourself to him as to why you're going to be a closer, why you're going to get the deal done so that he can allocate time to you and it's worth his time. If not, he doesn't have all day just take phone call after phone call after phone call to you know hear about you know how your day is going and, and how you want 10 caps. 
it's great. We all want that. But, it, it, you know, to his point earlier, it's a value for value trade. And you need to be ready to bring your A game so that he knows that you're a performer and you're going to get it done. G Dad, that's my two cents on it. What say you? Mr. J Dad, <clears throat> this is where I want to talk about becoming part of a community, whether it's our community or somebody else's community, because you need to know what questions to ask Tyler. Don't waste his time. If you don't know the vernacular, like Rich Dad says, if you don't know you have your financial education and you're talking about 10 caps in a five cap market, Tyler's going to hang out the phone on you like he should. He will. Bam. You're done, son. Bam. You know what I'm saying? Don't waste his time. Become part of a community. Start networking with other like-minded real estate investors. Start learning the space. Start learning what questions to ask Tyler. You know what I'm saying? Start learning how to engage the broker. Most important thing. And I think like Jake said, the other mindset, this is a business. This is not just an investment and it's not passive. It's a long-term play. It took us to chooches over here 18 months to get our first deal long time to get our first deal we were in it we kept getting rejected we didn't find the right broker until we found the right Tyler broker. hung up on me twice <laughs> <laughs> it, i'm being serious though it may, may hung up on me too i think so but <laughs> but but i'm just saying i mean we found the right broker finally we broke through we started to scale up we started treating it as a business as a long-term venture and then things started snowballing, that, that whole momentum. And then when you close your first deal, all of a sudden, Tyler says, I'm going to pick up that call from Jake and Gino because they did close in their first deal. I'm going to send them an opportunity. Don't be discouraged if Tyler doesn't send you an opportunity in the first month you meet him. I mean, listen, text him, get to know him. What football things he like? What sports does he like? What does he like to do? Is he a fisher? Does he like go hunting? I mean, what are his, you know, learn what his passions are and try to, you know, hey, send a book about something with him. Now that you know he likes personal development, go out there, find a book that he likes. Maybe send him Jake and Gino's book. Whatever it may be, try to connect with him and try to think of it as a long-term relationship because you're not going to buy an asset and you're done. You're going to continue to buy assets, continue to grow up, continue to build your team. So that's all I got, Mr. Cenziano. Hey, I just want to say thank you for everybody out there for listening. If you found value in today's show, please give us a positive review on iTunes. Tyler, thank you for your time. And Tyler did not really hang up on us. We're just actually building <laughs> rapport right now. So it's all good in the hood. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tyler. Time, guys. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, guys.